What do Jehovah's Witnesses believe? Is Jesus God? Is there a literal burning hell? And what about the 144,000? Today, we're going to talk about all of that, so stick around. This is the Lost Mission Podcast. Welcome back to the show. My name is Don Bain, and this is the Lost Mission Podcast, where it is our goal to help us as believers get back to our mission of knowing and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks for joining us today. Today we're going to continue our series on cults and fringe groups. But what is a cult? It's kind of a hard thing to define. We're defining cults as sort of a group that exists outside of orthodoxy, outside of Christian orthodoxy, um, that is sort of on the extremes. Not all extreme groups are cults. Some are more fringe groups, and we're going to talk about as many of those as we can. Today we're going to talk about sort of the core beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses. What do they really believe? But before we get into the video, if you like this channel, please consider subscribing and hitting the like button on this video. It's a small thing, but it really helps the channel out a lot. Thanks. So what are the core beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses? What are the things that we as Christians hold as foundational that um, may differ with Jehovah's Witnesses. Let's talk about some of those today. What do Jehovah's Witnesses believe about salvation? And much of this information is taken right from JW.org. You can go to their website and search these topics and you'll see what they think. Salvation is deliverance from sin and death is possible through the ransom sacrifice of Jesus. To benefit from that sacrifice, people must not only exercise faith in Jesus, but also change their course of life and get baptized. A person's works prove that his faith is alive. However, salvation cannot be earned. It comes through the undeserved kindness of God. So not only does their view uh, rely heavily on works, but it relies on another system they refer to as the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They will tell you that they don't believe in works uh, based salvation, but you can read right here on their website that they rely very heavily on their own works, but they say that ultimately God is the one that saves. But what is this ransom theory, the ransom sacrifice of Jesus? According to Jehovah's Witnesses, this is their belief. In the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witnesses translation of the scriptures, they, they say this, just as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom in exchange for many. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. They also point to Acts chapter 4, verse 12, again taken from the New World Translation. Furthermore, there is no salvation in any, anyone else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must get saved. And we would agree with the Jehovah's Witnesses that the Bible teaches that Christ died as a ransom for sinners. That would be an area of agreement between Christianity and Jehovah's Witnesses. But the problem is this. When you deal with cult groups, you have to focus strongly on semantics and the range of semantics. Basically this. You may be saying one thing. They may be saying the exact same words as you are saying, but the way they define those words and the way they define those things are totally different. So when you say, as a Christian, I believe in the ransom sacrifice of Christ, the Jehovah's Witness will pipe up and say, well, so do I. I believe the same thing. But the problem is how the Jehovah's Witnesses define this ransom and the way, the way that Christians define ransom. It would be how they look at Christ within that ransom and how the uh, Christians look at Christ within that ransom. So notice this. The two verses cited on JW.org lean heavily on the humanity of Christ. They refer to him as the Son of Man. They refer to him and say that there is no other name given among men. They rely heavily on the humanity of Christ. When Jehovah's Witnesses think of the death of Jesus, they view him only as a man. They view him only as a man. And as such, he died only as a man. Another scripture they will point to is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. This comes from the NASB, so not quoting from the New World Translation. Um, but this is the verse they use. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So Jehovah's Witnesses say that a mediator 
is someone separate from those who need mediation. So he can't be one needing the mediation. He has to be separate from them. And since man was the one needing mediation, then Jesus cannot be God. Let me slow down. Let me say that again. Jehovah's Witnesses say that a mediator is someone separate from those who need mediation. And since man was the one needing mediation, Jesus cannot be God. The problem is that the logic just it doesn't work. If Jesus cannot be God, he must because he must be separate from the two parties, then he can't be man either, following the, the thread of logic. It's, a, it's really a logical fallacy. It would just serve to reason that if Christ can mediate between God and and man as a man, then he must be able to mediate between God and man as God, just as much. So, so if the idea is that he has to be separate and he, he can't mediate as God, well, then he wouldn't be able to mediate as man. So since we understand that he did, he, that we view him as a mediator, it makes just as much sense to say that he would mediate as man to say that he would mediate as God. It was served to reason that if Christ can mediate between God and man as man, then he must also be able to mediate between God and man as God. And this is the truth of the matter. Christ is the God-man. He is both. He mediates as man and as God. He is divine and human. He is God. He is man. That, that hypostatic union of Christ of humanity and divinity, Christ, we view him as mediator because he is able to reach out to God and he is able to reach out as man. The Bible teaches that uh, God is our Savior and subsequently that Christ is our Savior. Christ is both Savior and God, right? Um, A couple of scriptures to look at there, Isaiah chapter 43 verse 11 that refers to God as our Savior, and in Luke chapter 2, the famous passage that refers to Christ as Savior. But according to Jehovah's Witnesses, this is not the case. Christ did not die as God and did not pay a ransom as God. He did it only, 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 only as man. Which leads into the the next core belief of Jehovah's Witnesses. What, What do Jehovah's Witnesses believe about God? Again, taken from JW.org, we worship the one true and almighty God, the creator, whose name is Jehovah. He is the God of Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. We follow the teachings and example of Jesus Christ and honor him as our Savior and as the Son of God. Thus, we're Christians. However, we have learned from the Bible that Jesus is not almighty God. And there is no scriptural basis for the Trinity doctrine. Jehovah's Witnesses not only deny that Christ is divine, but they also deny the doctrine of the Trinity altogether. So they they believe in one God. They don't believe Jesus is God. They also do not affirm the Trinity doctrine. From their book, Let God Be True, the obvious conclusion is, therefore, that Satan is the originator of the Trinity doctrine. And again, from JW.org, the God of the Bible is never described as being part of a trinity. So what do they believe? If they believe if they don't believe in a trinity, they obviously believe that Jesus died as a man. Well, who was Jesus before? They believe Jesus is actually Michael the Archangel. Michael, referred to by some religions as Saint Michael, is evidently a name given to Jesus before and after his life on earth. Again, from JW.org. To me, when, when we look at um, the perspective of Jesus as only an angel, as the angel Michael, Scripture so readily and so easily refutes this idea. If we go to Hebrews, the first chapter, it lets us know who Christ really is. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 9. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, and in many uh, portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Christ obviously is creator. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, 
and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as he had inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son. Today have I begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire? But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. So let's, let, let, let's look over this passage of Scripture a little bit. What are some of the things that Hebrews 1 actually has to say about Christ? Well, it lets us know first he is the exact representation of God's nature. Or in the King James Version, it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Immediately, the writer lets us know that Jesus is exactly like the Father in every way. In substance, he exactly represents the Father. Basically, he's saying that Jesus, while distinct from the Father, is still God. He has the same substance and is the same image as the Father. So he's letting us know there is, there is a difference there. Jesus and the Father are not the same being, but they are made of the same substance. They consist of the same substance. He is the exact representation of his nature. He also lets us know that he is so much better than the angels. He's not an angel. He is better than the angels. He, he reaches back to the Psalms and he quotes and he asks questions. For what, to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son. Today have I begotten you. Um, he does this to let them know that Jesus was more than an angel. He lets them know that the angels of God worship him. Angels worshiped Jesus. Nowhere in the Bible do we read of angels worshiping each other. The angels worship Jesus. And then finally, he, uh, he, he calls him God. Your throne, O oh God, is forever. Jesus, according to Hebrews, is God, distinct from the Father, but of the same substance. So not only do they deny the deity of Christ, they also claim the Holy Spirit is not divine, but rather he is an impersonal force. He's not even a person in Jehovah's Witness theology. The Holy Spirit is God's power in action, his active force. Again, jw.org. And then in, in large, bold letters on their website, the Holy Spirit is not a person. But is that what the Bible says? Okay, but here's the thing. We understand from the Scripture that while the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, just like the word rapture isn't found in the Bible, and neither is the word Bible found in the Bible, <laughs> um, the concept exists there. The idea of Father, Son, Holy Spirit being divine, working together in unity does exist. I feel like that with Jehovah's Witnesses, this is more of a straw man argument than anything else. It's not a strong, solid argument. It's something that they can set up and say, well, Trinity's not even found in Bible, so that way they can just knock it right back down. But what we do see in Scripture is this. We see the Trinity in action. We see them acting, creating, willing, giving gifts. In Genesis 1, then God said, let us, more than one, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle of the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 6. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. And verse 11 of the same chapter, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. So verse 6 tells us that God works all things. And then verse 11 tells us that the Spirit works all things, specifically referring to the Spirit as God. An impersonal force, an action, doesn't perform work. 
right? It is a work, but it doesn't actually perform work, but it lets us know that the Spirit is actually performing something. He is not just the doing, he is the one performing the action in a personal way. All right, so we see um, them referred to in personal pronouns, specifically the Spirit. John 14, verses 16 and 17, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Jesus refers to the Spirit as a person in a personal way. John 16, 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. Jesus obviously believed that the Holy Spirit was a was a person it is clear from the scripture the father is god that jesus the son is god and that the holy spirit is god all three equal yet distinct all three individual persons but operating as one god so the idea with jehovah's witnesses that jesus is not divine doesn't hold water when it comes to scripture. That the spirit is not even a person, that it is only an impersonal force, does not hold water when it comes to the scripture. The scriptural teaching is that God is a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And these three are not the same person. They are separate persons, but they work together in perfect harmony. But what about heaven and earth? What do Jehovah's Witnesses believe when it comes to heaven and earth? This is, this is their perspective. Jehovah God uh, Jesus Christ and the faithful angels reside in the spirit realm. A relatively small number of people, 144,000, will be resurrected to life in heaven to rule with Jesus in the kingdom. God created the earth to be mankind's home. God will bless obedient people with perfect health and everlasting life in an earthly paradise. So according to Jehovah's Witnesses, only 144,000 will go to heaven. All others will inhabit the earth and as such, they will live not in physical bodies, but in spiritual bodies. 144,000 go to heaven. They live with God. Everybody else, everybody else stays here in some spiritual state on the earth. As a matter of fact, I've even seen uh, videos from Jehovah's Witnesses where they would talk about, from sort of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, where they would talk about when they would go door to door and knock on doors, uh, they would see a nice and a beautiful home, a nice piece of property. They would visit with the homeowner, and when they would leave, they would talk about how they couldn't wait for uh, the resurrection, for the millennium, because they were going to basically own that home. It's, it's a religion that, that, that cultivates covetousness within its people to desire something that is not yours, which is sinful. Okay, so according to Jehovah's Witnesses, only 144,000 go to heaven, all others stay on the earth. They teach three classes of people. They teach in the anointed class of the 144,000. They teach uh, the, the larger class, uh, the other sheep, which is all other believers, and then the final class, which are the lost or the damned. So the king, Christ Jesus, was put to death in the flesh and was resurrected an invisible creature. This is from Let God Be True. Therefore, the world will see him no more. He went to prepare a heavenly place for his associate members, the body of Christ, for they too will be invisible creatures. Their citizenship is in heaven. So they believe that Christ's resurrection was actually an invisible or a spiritual resurrection, not a physical resurrection. That Christ did not physically rise from the grave. And likewise, that believers, when they're resurrected, will not be resurrected in a physical sense. So not only do they deny the physical resurrection of the body, they deny the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. The very thing that Christianity hinges on and hangs on being the physical resurrection of Jesus, Jehovah's Witnesses deny this. But what does the Bible say? <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15 Verses 3 through 8, For I delivered to you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, 
then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. He then appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So while the Watchtower view undermines the very thing that Christianity is built upon, the resurrection of Jesus, the Bible says very clearly, says differently. Not only does it state that Jesus rose from the dead, it cites several examples right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul tells us that Jesus appeared to Peter, that he appeared to the apostles, physically appeared to 500 brethren, he appeared to James, and then of all to all the apostles, which possibly was the 70 that Christ had had sent out, and he appeared physically to Paul. So again, the idea that Christ only resurrected in a spiritual sense is refuted by the Bible itself. But what about the 144,000? The 144,000, the little flock, or the anointed class, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, this is what they believe, taken from, again, the New World Translation. We'll read from there this time. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 3 in the New World Translation. Then I saw and look, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who have his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. I heard a sound coming out of the heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the sound that I heard was like singers who accompany themselves by playing on their harps. And they are singing what seems to be a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one was able to master that song except the 144,000 who have been brought from the earth. So what's the problem with the view? What's the problem with the Jehovah's Witness perspective of 144,000? Some of it we just read. It's in, it's in the Bible, not just in the Bible. It is in the New World Translation. It is in their Bible. The 144,000, it speaks of 144,000 in heaven. But what they do is they, they, they <laughs> the Jehovah's Witnesses pull sort of a, a switcheroo in their doctrine, in, in their beliefs, right in the middle of Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. They will tell you there are only 144,000 people that will be saved. But they don't read the entire verse. If their interpretation were correct, then only Jews could be saved in heaven. Only Jews. Because it says, Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, they were sealed, 144,000 Jews, from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And the switcheroo that they pull, the thing they do, is the literal reading of the 144,000, and then the figurative reading of the sons of Israel portion. And this is just bad Bible study. To make one portion literal, 144,000, the other portion figurative, right there in the middle of the same verse. Um, also, Revela Revelation 14.4. These are the ones, so reading on down from, from where they would like us to read, if you read on down through the chapter, these are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. So this passage states that the 144,000 did not defile themselves with women. So not only are they Jews, they are either unmarried or celibate Jewish men. They must be men because they didn't defile themselves with women. So only 144,000 Jewish men that are celibate or are unmarried. If we're going to take the Jehovah's Witness hermeneutic and apply it to this passage of Scripture. And I really doubt that if you were to ask any Jehovah's Witness if they believed that a woman could be included in the 144,000, if you were to really ask them, that they would say, oh no, women women can't be in heaven. <laughs> There'll be no women in heaven. John chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with the shepherd. Um, another popular verse Jehovah's Witnesses like to use. 
While the flock may be small, it is not a divided flock. There is not a divided um, section within Christendom. There is not the anointed class and then the little flock. Christ made it clear that there would be one flock under one shepherd, speaking of unity, and we will abide in one heavenly kingdom. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. So for the next time that Jehovah's Witnesses go around knocking on doors and are thinking they'll have these beautiful properties, well, Scripture lets us know, don't set our affections on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Uh, John chapter 14, verses 1 through, th- one, uh, through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So the the, the idea with Jehovah's Witnesses that only 144,000 will be saved and taken to heaven just does not work. In, in the scope of Scripture. So there's their, their perspective of heaven and of earth. But what about hell? What about the soul? Here's what they believe. People who die pass out of existence. They do not suffer in a fiery hell of torment. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that hell is simply the grave, and that all people, good and bad, go there. Everybody dies Everybody goes to hell. As a matter of fact, in their book, Let God Be True, there is an entire chapter that is entitled, Hell, a place of rest in hope. So the distorted view of hell is a view called annihilationism, that basically when people die, they cease to exist in the Jehovah's Witness perspective of annihilationism. Um, there, there are other perspectives of annihilationism that exist out there, but the Jehovah's Witness perspective is that people simply cease to exist. Their misinformed view of hell comes from a misunderstanding of biblical words, namely of death and of hell. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that death is extinction or unconsciousness. And let God be true. Speaking of the death of man, the psalmist says, his breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. He enters into unconsciousness. What do they believe about hell? Um, From you can live in paradise on earth. Hell could not be a place of torment because such an idea never came into the heart of God. Additionally, to torment a person eternally because he did wrong for a few years is contrary to justice. How good is it to know the truth about the dead? It can truly set one free from fear and superstition. But we as Christians, we understand this a bit differently. Our, our, the, those are the distortions of death and of hell. But we understand that death speaks of the ceasing of existence of the mortal body. And hell speaks of a place of eternal punishment. Psalm 146, when it says that man's thoughts perish, is not meaning that the man ceases to exist. Um, this is just, again, poor exegesis of Scripture. Um, it's actually speaking of man's thoughts on earth, of his goals, of his dreams, of his desires, of the things that he does and the things that he he wants to do, but not of the man himself ceasing to exist. His thoughts on earth may be over, but he has now transitioned over into an afterlife. And as far as hell is concerned, there are many, many, many scriptures that speak of an eternal punishment, of a flame that doesn't go out, of a fire that is not is not quenched, of worms that, that, that don't die, of a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, of an eternal punishment over and over and over throughout the Bible. So for them to say that it never entered into the heart of God, um, a place of eternal torment, then I would just recommend they read the New Testament and find that over and again in, um, in, in very plain language, The Bible lets us know that hell is a place of eternal torment, not just of of burning up and of dying and that being the end, but that a person goes and they spend an eternity 
in punishment. So while they feel as if they are relieving the fear and superstition surrounding hell, what they are actually doing is causing in a non-believer a false sense of hope that when they die, there will be no judgment, no eternal punishment for their, their sins. And that is just not what Scripture teaches. All right, so today we've only scratched the surface of so many of Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs. But I think all of these beliefs are, are essential to understanding who Jehovah's Witnesses are and what they believe. Um, these are some of their core doctrines. And it's so, so important that you and I know the truth. Uh, the truth will make us free. But also, it will help us to be more equipped when we go to others to show them the truth that in turn, they can be free. So guys, it's so vital, it's so important that we understand our word, that we study the show ourselves approved, that, that we know what, what the word of God teaches, that we can be ready when these people come to us, but hopefully we can go to them with the truth of the gospel, that there is a Jesus, and he is God, and he is the Savior, and there is absolutely an eternal hell. And when they die, if they have not uh, received Christ as their Savior, then sadly they will spend eternity apart from God and not just be done. <laughs> All right, guys, that's going to do it for this one. Grace and peace. Guys, until next time, I hope you have a great week, and I will see you later.